Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're at in the world. Welcome to the third and final day of the 2020 International E-Conference on Religion and the Holocaust. I'm Dr. Darren Slade. I'm president of the Global Center for Religious Research. I want to say thank you so much for supporting this event, coming out and attending. What's incredible about these academic conferences is that you didn't have to leave the safety and comfort of your own home to attend. There's definitely no travel fees, no hotel fees. You get to hear the latest scholarship in Holocaust studies right in your own pajamas if you wanted to. So thank you for being a part of us. Uh, so I have the distinct pleasure of introducing one of the foremost world scholars, an award-winning scholar on Holocaust studies and Jewish studies. It is my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce to you Dr. David Patterson. Dr. Patterson today is going to be speaking about the Islamic Jihad and the Holocaust from Hitler to Hamas. Dr. Patterson is the Hillel A. Feinberg Distinguished Chair in Holocaust Studies at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies at the University of Texas in Dallas. He's a commissioner on the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, a member of the executive board of academic advisors for the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy, a member of the executive board of the annual Scholars Conference on the Holocaust in the Churches. He's winner of the National Jewish Book Award, the Correct Jewish Book Award, and the Holocaust Scholars Conference Eternal Flame Award. He's written over 35 books and more than 220 articles, essays, and book chapters on topics ranging from literature, philosophy, the Holocaust, and generalized Jewish studies. In fact, he has two upcoming books coming out, the Shoah and Torah, and Eli Weissel's Hasidic Legacy. Now, I want to highlight two of his uh, more recent books here, The Holocaust and the Non-Representable. Now, in this volume, Dr. Patterson explores uh, topics about viewing the soul or the relation between body and soul, environmentalist thought, and the phenomenon of torture, and the philosophical and theological warrant for genocide. If you guys have a chance of taking a look at this book or purchasing a copy, I highly recommend it. The book here takes a unique approach and it gives us a nice philosophical perspective on genocide. The next book I want to talk about is A Genealogy of Evil, Antisemitism from Nazism to Islamic Jihad. Now in this book, Dr. Patterson explores jihadist antisemitism and what he does is he challenges the idea that jihadist antisemitism has medieval roots. Instead, he identifies as distinctly modern characteristics by tracing interconnections that link the Nazis to the Muslim Brotherhood, and even all the way up to more modern uh, factions like Al-Qaeda and the Iranian Islamic Republic. Again, I highly recommend this book. So if you get a chance to purchase a copy, please do. And with that said, I would like to turn it over to my good friend, Dr. Patterson. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks so much, Darren. Um, and it's good to be here. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to uh, tune in, take a look. Um, yes, I. one of the uh, t topics that when it comes to religion and the Holocaust that, that is rarely addressed is uh, the role of Islamic Jihad in the Holocaust. Very little is known about about that, or at least very little is discussed about that. Um, this image is a picture of one of the the kites that Hamas uh, has you know has used in the past to to send incendiary devices over Israel. And as you can see, some of their kites, like this one, bear you know the swastika. Um, another point of, of similarity, uh, and today I'll talk about both influences and parallels, and there are differences, of course. But one text they have in common, jihad, Islamic jihadism and national socialism, is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which Hitler quotes in his 
infamous work, Mein Kampf, saying to what extent the whole existence of the Jews is based on a continuous lie is shown incomparably by the protocols of the elders of Zion and in the, in the Hamas charter, the charter of Allah, uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion is used as a, a, a proof text to demonstrate the, the truth of what is stated in the charter. The charter, Hamas charter of Allah uses three main sources as its proof text. The Quran, of course, uh, passages from the Hadith, the, uh, the, the body of texts and, uh, from the, you know, teachings of the Prophet that were not in the Quran, and the protocols of the elders of Zion. Now, uh, just as a reminder, the protocols of the elders of Zion is a notorious fake forged text of minutes secretly taken in secret meetings of Jewish leaders plotting to take over the world. Um, it was compiled between 1897 and 1899 under the direction of a, of a czarist secret police agent named Pyotr Ivanovich Rachkovsky. Uh, Rachkovsky drew quite a bit on uh, a couple of novels from the middle of the 19th century, one called uh, Biarritz, by Hermann Goethe, published in 1864, and another, I'm sorry, 1868, and another called Dialogues in Hell by Maurice Jolie, published in 1864. Um, the Protocols was published initially in the journal Znamya, which means the banner, in 1903. And then uh, the distribution of the Protocols was taken up by another Tsarist agent named uh, Sergei Alexandrovich Nilus. Now, the protocols, as a, the text, was widely circulated really after, uh, I would say, first the First World War. The First World War was uh, a huge catastrophe for Western civilization, <clears throat> as you know. Uh, it, it represented an upheaval of not just uh, political systems and uh, political borders, but of many of the values that, that we thought we had attained, uh, many of the truths that we lived by, ideas of progress. It was, it was a catastrophe. It was an, uh, in, an inexplicable catastrophe. Uh, this is true not only in Germany, where they, you know, like how, how could we have lost? We fought no battles on our own soil. Um, and of course, they have the, the, the legend of the Dochstos, the stab in the back. It came from the Jews, but the whole catastrophe came from the Jews. So you have the protocols being widely circulated. The protocols was translated into Arabic in 1926. Um, so this is a common touchstone for the Nazis and for the jihadists. Now, the, the, the pivotal figure in the, uh, in the role of Islamic Jihad in the Holocaust and the connection that would ensue between the Nazis and the jihadists is Hajimin al-Husseini. Uh, Al-Husseini served in the Turkish army in the First World War. He uh, was in, in the region of Smyrna, which uh, was where much of the genocidal activity against the Armenians took place. The, the extent of his involvement in the Armenian genocide is, is debated. Um, he, uh, from there, he, ended, he was in, in, went to Palestine under the British mandate. Uh, in 1920, he incited riots against the British and the Jews. Uh, this came in the wake of the, of the Weizmann-Faisal agreement between Chaim Weizmann and King Faisal, which was the first uh, document to outline a two-state solution. Uh, they, they, that agreement is from 1919, the previous year. And uh, he was found guilty in absentia and uh, was, you know, was a wanted criminal. Uh, however, on the 8th of May, 1921, 
the new British governor of the mandate, Herbert Samuel, in an effort to appease the, the Arab unrest in Palestine, appointed Haj Amin al-Husseini, Mufti of Jerusalem. So he, al-Husseini became the religious leader of the, of the Muslim population in Palestine. And his first act as Mufti was to declare jihad against the Jews and the British. And he went on to incite, you know, other riots. And um, he, was, he was a big thorn in the side for the British. Uh, he had his first meeting with a Nazi, the, the German consul in Jerusalem, on March 31st, 1933. Now, you, got to, you keep your timeline in, line, in mind here. Um, Hitler be became chancellor January 30th, 1933, which basically put the Nazis in power. Um, concentration camp Dachau was up and running by the end of March 1933, when, when al Husseini met with, uh, with uh, the German consul Heinrich Wolf in Jerusalem. So al Husseini immediately establishes a connection with the Nazis. And, in fact, and the Nazis encourage that connection. Um, probably the most uh, notorious uprising that took place in Palestine took place in 1936 and was incited once again by al Husseini in 1936. And uh, he received a lot of money for organizing the revolt from Nazi Germany. Um, in 1937, on October 2nd, Al Husseini had his first meeting with Adolf Eichmann and Herbert Hagen, Eichmann's uh, deputy. Um, some question whether Eichmann was actually at this meeting or not, um, but in any case, he, he, he developed further his connections with the Nazis, and he's not the only one. I mean, the, the, the whole region had many connections with, with the Nazis. In fact, at the time, there was a, like a, a jingle uh, that, that went around saying, no more, uh, no more, uh, Monsieur, no more Mr. in heaven, Allah on earth, Hitler. The Monsieur, the French, Mr. the British, French and British occupiers. Um, Matthias Kunzel, one of the scholars of this period, points out that, that the Arab revolt took place against the background of swastikas and uh, youth organizations in Palestine that would, would salute each other with the Nazi salute. So there was already a, a significant, you know, level of sympathizers for the Nazis at this time in Palestine. Um, meanwhile, back in Egypt, in March 1928, uh, Hassan al-Banna founded the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood is, is uh, really the key. It's really the, you know, the, the, the tree that branches out into various jihadist organizations today. I mean, it continues till now. Most of the jihadist organizations in the world can trace their origins to the Muslim Brotherhood. And I'm talking about governments, the Sudanese government, um, the National Islamic Front in Sudan under the leadership of Hassan al-Turabi, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini, <clears throat> received his indoctrination from the Brotherhood well before the revolution. Uh, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, received his indoctrination from the Brotherhood, and there are many other examples. Um, Albana uh, drafted this creed when the, when the Brotherhood was founded, 
Allah is our goal, the Prophet is our leader, the Quran is our law, Jihad is our way, Jihad meaning war, holy war, and death in the service of Allah is our highest desire. Um, Albana argued that, that anyone who does, is not either involved in Jihad personally or who is not supporting it financially uh, shall face the fires of hell. It's, it's, it's like, for him, it's like one of the five pillars of, of the faith. Now, Albana was familiar with the writings of Hitler. And uh, although Mein Kampf was not translated in its entirety, portions of it were, and he, uh, for example, uh, indicated that it was Hitler who made him realize that Zionism, as Hitler says in Mein Kampf, is not about uh, creating a, a home or a, or a haven for the Jews. It's about creating a base of operations for world domination. And the Protocols of the Elders of Zion proves this. Again, um, he also learned from Hitler the importance of propaganda. Uh, Hitler discusses propaganda at some length in Mein Kampf. And he realized, he says, Hitler, he says, Hitler made me realize that propaganda does not aim, certainly doesn't aim to inform. And it doesn't even aim to persuade. Its purpose, as Hitler describes it, is to incite, and specifically to incite hatred. It's about inciting hatred. And indeed, he uh, took this to heart. He had a propaganda division set up already in 1935, and they, they, they had a, a huge campaign during the Arab Revolt in support of the Mufti Hajimina Husseini. In 1938, um, he had a, a conference in Cairo called the Parliamentary Conference for Arab and Muslim Countries. At the conference, they handed out copies of, of portions of Mein Kampf in Arabic and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in Arabic. Um, what you see on the screen is, is, are not the, 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 the books that they handed out, but these are, you know, later editions. Uh, this particular edition of Mein Kampf uh, was translated in 19, uh, was published in 1963. It's translated by Louis al Haj, who was a Nazi war criminal converted to Islam. And in his introduction to his Arabic language edition, he describes Hitler as a great jihadist. Now, the Brotherhood, uh, thanks, thanks to Haji Amina Hussein, he was able to develop connections with the Nazis. They sent representatives to Nuremberg rallies. Uh, they worked with the Nazis in, uh, during the war period as well. In 1943, Anwar Sadat, whom I'm sure you have heard of, uh, was arrested as a spy by the British, and Anwar Sadat was part of the Muslim Brotherhood at that time. Meanwhile, uh, Hajimina Husseini pursues his involvement with the Nazis. Um, he had to flee Palestine in October 1937. At, once again, wanted for inciting the Arab revolt. He turned up again in Baghdad, in Iraq, uh, April 1941. The war is already underway, well underway. Um, 1941, as you may recall, is the year that the, the Nazis made their move to the east, June 22nd, 1941, with Operation Barbarossa. They invaded the Soviet territories. Um, they had planned to invade uh, May 1st, but they got held up in the Balkans. Um, in any case, they're also moving 
in 41, they're moving in the Middle East and they, under the, the leadership of Haji Amin al-Husseini, and there were other you know, Iraqi leaders, uh, they, they overthrew the British-backed government of Iraq. Uh, they began the coup on April 3rd, 1941. It was very quickly successful, but within, uh, by the end of May, the British had, you know, pretty much regained control. And right before he once again had to flee, Hajimin al Husseini incited yet another riot against the Jews of Baghdad. It's known as the Farhud, in which uh, more than 600 Jews were killed and, and thousands wounded. So he, he leaves Iraq, He's, he flees from Iraq, June 1941, goes to Tehran, from Tehran he went to uh, Rome, from Rome he went to Berlin, where he had his first meeting with Hitler on November 28, 1941. And in his uh, memoirs, he, he says this about his meeting with Hitler, with the Fuhrer. So our fundamental condition for cooperating with Germany was a free hand to eradicate every last Jew from Palestine and the Arab world. I asked Hitler for an explicit undertaking to allow us to solve the Jewish problem in a manner befitting our national and racial aspirations and according to the scientific methods innovated by Germany. He said, the answer I got was, the Jews are yours. Now, Hajimin al-Husseini was very close, quickly became very close to a number of the uh, leaders in the SS. Uh, here are three whom he knew well. R Rudolf Hirsch, Commandant of Auschwitz. Uh, Franz Zieres. Commandant of Mauthausen and Josef Kramer, Commandant of Belsen. Um, he uh, was involved in Arabic language propaganda, brought radio broadcasts, and radio was the main means of getting information and news throughout the world at that time. Uh, in those broadcasts, he, in keeping with the, the principle of Islamic Jihad, he, he would preach that killing a Jew is pleasing to Allah. Anyone who kills a Jew has a guaranteed place in paradise. Hassan al-Banna would make the same statement. Uh, it's the blood of the Jew is your ticket to salvation. So that here, and then this is a little different from the Nazi, anti-Semitism. Here, uh, the hatred of the Jew is not, and the killing, extermination of the Jew is not an unpleasant necessity, as Himmler may have viewed it, but it's a religious duty. It's a holy act pleasing to God, because it's not that all Jews are evil, it's that all evil is Jewish. To hate evil is to hate the Jews. To purge the world of evil is to purge the world of the Jews. Now, Al Husseini was closest of all the SS leaders to Heinrich Himmler, who was the head of the SS. Uh, working with Himmler, he organized several SS killing units consisting entirely of Muslims, operating mainly in the Balkans. Um, most of the Muslim members of these killing units were from the Balkans. They were not, for the most part, they were not Arabs from uh, Palestine or elsewhere in the Middle East. I've seen estimates of as many as 100,000 Muslims recruited by al-Husseini who fought for the Nazis. Uh, it sounds a little high to me, but there were certainly tens of thousands in any case. And um, each regiment had its religious leader, its mullah. Uh, the largest, the most infamous, was the 13th Hanshar Division. <clears throat> their, their commander, uh, Carl Gustav Zauberzweig, 
once said that the Muslims see in our Fuhrer the mission of a second prophet. Um, Al Husseini compared Hitler to, you know, a second prophet himself. And here he is, you know, parade on parade with, and you can see uh, Carl Gustav uh, to the to the on the right side of the page with the patch over his eye. And then this is the Hanshar division, February 1944. Now, Al was a wanted war criminal for his activities with the in, in, in organizing these killing units. Uh, he was never captured. There were more than 150,000 wanted, named war criminals that were wanted. They were not, they were not all German, of course. Witness Haj Amina Husseini. Tens of thousands of them found haven in the Middle East. He turned up in Cairo, June 20th, 1946, where he received a hero's welcome from Hassan al-Banna, uh, praising him for carrying jihad to Europe, the jihad against the Jews. The, the, the number one target of Islamic jihad is, is the Jews. They, they also target, you know, the West in general, the Crusaders, but the West in general and the Crusaders, the Christians, were corrupted by the Jews. And we have this from the most important ideologue of the Muslim Brotherhood, Saeed Qutb, who, with Hassan al-Banna, embraced al Husseini in 1946. Uh, Albana was assassinated in 1949, and Kuta would, would go on to become the most important spokesman for what the, re what the Brotherhood represents. Uh, one of his most famous books is called Milestones. It's read throughout the Muslim world. He, is, he continues to be the most influential thinker in the jihadist world, a Saeed Kuta. Uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini translated his works into Farsi, for example. Um, he also has a, you know, a famous diatribe against the Jews called Our Struggle with the Jews, written in 1953, in which he, I mean, he describes the, the war against the Jews as a war against Satan. Um,